My name is Irene, and I, along with Rakan Bach, who's standing in the back, are the organizers of New Mexico Listens. Also with us is our videographer, Goyo Perez, who will be recording this event, and it will be shared with the Human Rights Alliance through Kevin Bowen. We have one on the way to Kevin, which should have arrived this last week, but it will arrive next week. And this will be permanently archived on the New Mexico Humanities Council website. New Mexico Listens is an effort originally funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, which then gave state grants to all 50 states to their, New Mex to their state humanities councils. The New Mexico Humanities Council chose to reach out to the League of Women Voters and ask for folks from the League of Women Voters who would be interested in implementing the project. And Santa Fe County is one of the leagues in New Mexico who said, yes, we would implement. And we've been running events since early December, I think December 1st or 2nd, we've been running events in Santa Fe County. Those events have all been grassroots. They've all been small. Kevin Bowen, who is our moderator today, will introduce our panel who are definitely well-known people and people who work hard to make a difference in Santa Fe County. Most of our listening sessions have involved ordinary folks from all over Santa Fe County. And they've been, that have not necessarily been heard before. And we're very proud that we've made them heard. This project will be ending in probably the first two weeks of October. The grant period is over then. And I'm going to do this now, and I'm also going to do it again at the end. We're running two more events. We have an event at the end of August, and then it's August 28th, and we will have another probably early October. I'll speak about them more at the end. But this one, we're very proud and we're very grateful to have a panel of such talent. And I'm turning things over to Kevin Bowen. It's working. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin Bowen. I am the president of the Human Rights Alliance here in Santa Fe. Um, among some of the things we do is we produce the annual Pride celebration every year. And in my role as the president, um, I have agreed for us to be very involved um, from the standpoint of community, grassroots, organizing and mobilizing um, especially given where we are right now. Um, the next thing that I would like to do, though, is to pay respect to the land that we are on and uh, to the Native Americans, the Tewa Indians, the Hikarilla Hibachi, uh, who and many others who occupied this land because it is not our land. It was their land first, and we are here to share that land with all of them. So that being said, um, the panelists from my right to my left are Adrian Lawyer from the Transgender Resource Center, Patty Boucher, who's a former city councilor here in Santa Fe, Councilor Sig Lindell, who's a current city councilor here in Santa Fe, and Marcy Moon, who is chair of the Envision Fund, part of the Santa Fe Community Foundation. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about um, what they do. Adrian, why don't you start? Hi, I'm Adrian Lawyer. I use he pronouns, and I am now the executive director emeritus, but I will always be one of the founders of the Transgender Resource Center of New Mexico. So we are a statewide organization. That's why we're here today. We're not headquartered in Santa Fe or Santa Fe County, but we absolutely serve people not just throughout the state of New Mexico, but the Southwestern region where there are not a lot of resources through direct services, advocacy, and education. And I have more information and literature about our center and you can find out more about us on our website, tgrcnm.org. Hi, Patty Boucher. I am really probably here to give you a little bit of the history of uh, LGBTQ plus um, in this area in Santa Fe County and in the state. I served for 22 years um, as an openly gay city councilor uh, and many pieces of legislation came through when I had the opportunity to serve this community 
and including some statewide, um, also had the opportunity to be one of the founding members of the Human Rights Alliance and the Human Rights Election Fund, and pretty a good number of things uh, and organizations that uh, happen. In fact, Sherry is here, um, and we got through a hate crimes bill, um, a variety of things. So it's uh, important. Local government is a great place to get things done. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, my name is Signe Lindell. I am a current city councilor. And uh, I've had the, uh, I'm not a kid. I'm, um, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, worn out a lot of pairs of shoes marching. A um, little discouraged that it's getting harder instead of easier, which I, I, I was where I thought we were headed, but um, we need to keep our shoes laced up and keep going. Um, we do things locally. We get things done here. New Mexico has been a, a friendly state to our community. However, nationally, um, we all need to dig in and be ready to go because we're in that kind of time right now. I'm, Mar I'm Marcy Silvestro of Moonsong Productions, but people call me that a lot too. Um, Anyway, I am the chair of the Envision Fund of the Santa Fe Community Foundation, which is a fund, a statewide fund that gives grants to the LGBTQ plus community. I am also the former director of the Boston um, <clears throat> Gay Rights Gay and Lesbian Rights Committee, which helped pass the first marriage bill in this country. I worked with GLAAD to pass that bill. So, and I have been an active feminist working with Gloria Steinem and Bella Ubbs, who wrote speeches for these women and worked with them very closely. So um, this issue, the Roe versus Wade, as well as the LGBTQ communities issues are very, very important to me. Okay. That's a great group of people who have a lot of wisdom. Um, I want to clarify my pronouns are he, him, his. I did not state that earlier. And just as a little aside, I was on a recent call this week with community leaders from across the country as part of Centrelink, which is an LGBTQ plus membership organization that the Transgender Resource Center is also part of. And it was very refreshing to hear a discussion about pronouns amongst people who are my age and even older uh, about the uh, openness and fluidity that many people recognized we never had when we came out. So there was uh, a good discussion. And, and the whole premise of the discussion this week was that we as leaders needed to make sure we take care of ourselves in the process of what is happening here across the country, which I think is important. So without further ado of any of these things, given the what's occurred with SCOTUS with Roe versus Wade, which has taken uh, a community of people who were always marginalized and made them even more marginalized. I'm speaking about women. Um, you know, as a leader, I'm asking each of these people who are sitting here with me in the community, what do you think are the major concerns for the LGBTQIA plus community nationally and locally moving forward between now and let's just give it a finite end period, but it's always ongoing for the election this fall. And Adrian, I'll start with you. I'm sorry about that. Maybe Sam. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, I think that we've already seen that there's a lot of um, national implications around the way that the decision was made. And taking the privacy argument then means like even things like Obergefell then become endangered, right? So gay marriage, I mean, the, the, it, it appears to me that there's an attempt to roll back what have seemed like fundamental civil rights protections over the last 50 years. And so when you think about gay marriage and how really relatively recent it was, I think it would be naive not to think that that would be also on the chopping block here because of that. 
But for me, it just also, you know, I think speaks to the fact that we can get sort of entrenched in our in our silos around what we're doing. For trans people, we see that, you know, marriage wasn't our primary goal in the first place. It was health care that people need. Um, you know, now for trans people who are not gay, gay marriage is really not even still a, a banner issue, right? So and then the and the for the reproductive stuff, I think, you know, trans people right now are observing how difficult it is even to just open up to the idea that people who can get pregnant are not all women. And I'm, you know, I'm an old lesbian. I, you know, I came out in 1985 as a lesbian and started my medical transition in 2004. I'm a second wave feminist, lifelong feminist, you know, brought up that way. I understand that women are a group under assault in our country, but so are trans people. And we need to be, instead of separating further, figuring out how we can include each other, even in the way that we talk, without so much resistance and vitriol, or feeling so defensive, right? How are we gonna make sure that we don't keep edging each other out as we've seen done, you know, over the decades? Patty. That was great, Adrian. Uh, you know, we are always in the same situation. We're always on the defensive. We're always making sure. I mean, some of us worked decades to get marriage equality in this state. Um, and to see things roll back would be terrible. I mean, the, the choice situation affects everybody. And the biggest concern I have is that we get out to vote that we get out everybody to vote for. I mean, but it's been that same way forever. I mean, when my siblings would ever, you know, to say they want to go for a third party vote, I'd say, take pictures of your daughter, your sisters into the voting booth with you. And remember that the SCOTUS is, you know, absolutely everything. And look where we are today because of that. Um, so what I would really hope is that we would continue to be a um, pro-choice state, that the Democrats would remain in charge, that this governor uh, would uh, remain in, in also in power. Um, and then I think, you know, we have to help our neighboring states. But the real concern for me is that, you know, we I, I want to see things happen at the federal level. I want to see those protections get in place. And there's some possibility of that. I have spoken to some of my attorney friends and, you know, they feel we have some safeguards that, um, would be a little different than the whole choice issue, um, you know, so as far as safeguarding marriage equality. But, you know, we've all worked too hard. We all really want to see privacy issues remain in place. You know, I mean, it's it's all related, as Adrian mentioned. And, you know, we we certainly have to be worried and we will continue. We're always on the defensive. We're always looking to see who's coming next to, to change things up. But I will say this is the most positive I've felt about New Mexico, New Mexico politics in a long time. You know, we've gone from red to purple to blue, and I'm thinking we're going to stay blue, but it depends on you getting out to vote. Thank you. The major concerns, um, uh, there are so many of them. I mean, why why was it that the Biden administration felt it necessary to make a ruling on the USDA to make sure that school lunch programs don't deny lunch money to queer and trans children? That's ridiculous. And you know what happened with that this week? 20 AGs filed a lawsuit about it. I mean, th the concerns are just stacking up. Um, not feeding children, really? We have to fight that fight? Um, I think it, it's really important <clears throat> that we do stay super involved locally, but we also have to get really involved and pay attention nationally. Because these are, these are the kinds of things that don't really um, come at us. 
and we don't see them. I, I doubt that very many people in this room knew that that was happening. Um, ACLU has jumped on it, um, but 20, I mean, 20 states attorney generals are filing a lawsuit over the FDA saying that you can't deny lunch money to queer and trans children. Just ridiculous. Um, maybe these are the um, kinds of issues strategically that um, help us because they're emotional issues, they're value issues. And I don't think that most people want children to go hungry. And I think there are issues that we can grab onto and we can get traction with this kind of issue. So nationally, it's happening all around us with the oddest um, subject matters possible, not feeding children. Um, so those are my thoughts. We need to keep ourselves really involved nationally because they just try to eat away and pick away and pick away at us. So. Marcy, what do you got? How many hours do I have? <laughs> I think for me, we're looking at toxic masculinity. We're looking at misogyny. We're looking at the hatred of women uh, as second class citizens. And we're looking at the reality that all the isms are connected. Racism, heterosexism, I can continue on. Um, I'm someone who's over 50, I'm probably with Kevin <laughs> in that reality. I've earned these gray hairs. Some of them have the same name on them. Um, but the reality is this overturning is the beginning of dismantling human rights in our, in our country. And I think we really have to look at that. I think it's related to what you said, what you said, Adrian, and, and the whole reality, it goes from children to, from the birth to the grave. I think we're going to start seeing more separation of um, hitting sort of horizontal violence, the elders against the young people, the young people against the trans people, trans against the gay, whatever. I think it's a setup for horizontal violence to be recognized as an OK thing to do in our country. And that really has to stop. And I think it's it's I was one of the things I didn't mention is I am the former director of Esperanza Shelter in this community, which is the domestic violence agency. I refired. I didn't retired. I refired four years ago. But the reality is the model of even our government um, is a power over model. And I think there are people now that are gaining thinking that power of that toxic masculinity and the patriarchal reality is what is important to their ego and their narcissism. So I think we have to look on the physical, mental, emotional, and even obviously the spiritual level. Uh, the Christian nationalism reality is really sad and sick. I'm a theology major. And I could throw scripture quotes out too, but you don't only throw the quotes out. How are you living that reality? And for some of them, they, you know, they're claiming Jesus and other things, uh, but they are denying people their fundamental human rights. So I think we have to look at all levels of um, the reality of what is happening in this country and even in our own communities. So let me pick up on a couple of those things that I think are all interrelated um, before we go to the next question. So Adrian, you mentioned about more inclusive language and, um, you know, people have heard me say many times that as a community, we tend to eat our own and it's really not where we need to be right now. Um, and so with the more inclusive language, I think they're, you know, sharing information, we might be able to know more about how, how we talk and how we um, react with one another. Um, especially what keeps coming up for me before we go into this next question that I've always been concerned about is how do we get 
other members of our community this information and give them the tools they need to fight back when people um, come at them with something. Let's just use a quick thing that's going to come up in the gubernatorial election this fall, I'm sure, is going to be critical race theory. And yeah. what we're teaching these children in school, sex education is going to be claimed to be taught to young children or specifically LGBTQ sex education. I don't really know what that means, but I've heard some of the candidates use that terminology. So to try to pull it back in here, how can our LGBTQIA plus community address and react to these things, these issues, these concerns? Um, can we reference history? Are there current references we can do? And what what do you all have as input as some of the elders here? And you're the youngest one there, Adrian. <laughs> Turned 52 this month. Uh, right. <laughs> um, I know, yeah, that's for all the best people, right? <laughs> so you're saying, how do we do this? How do we include each other more? How do we, how do we include each other more? And um, how can, as a community, people react? Like if you were going to say to the community, people who are listening both online and here and and in, these conversations need to go on, but how can, what can we do? Yeah, I mean, the list goes on and on to me, you know, I think there's so much people can do. And I think it's so tempting to get mired down and, and being discouraged and despairing. In fact, I actually think that's part of the strategy of the opposition is to just flood us with all these negative things, events and stories till we just are like, ah, there's nothing I can do. But there's so many things we can do. I mean, even just starting with individual voting, but then helping to register voters, helping to get people to the polls, helping people to vote in that way. I think reaching out beyond our silos is a big part of it, too. You know, at TGRC, we work in a whole lot of different areas. So we have partners in um, like the homelessness service provision area. We have partners in substance abuse. We have partners in behavioral health. We have partners, you know, all, all different areas all around the state that we're working with. So it keeps us thinking about things that aren't just whatever we would call quote unquote trans issues. It helps me to remember that everything is a trans issue. Everything is an LGBTQ issue. So for LGBTQ people to get involved in climate change, to get involved in immigration, to get involved in all of the different things that are out there and not just think that all it is is LGBTQ. For me, even LGB people to get deeply involved in the trans stuff right now, because this is in, in many ways where the cutting edge of disparity and persecution lies within our communities is on the trans edge. So when we see gay and lesbian folks, bisexual folks getting involved in trans liberation, we're starting to cross over that way. I think we also have to do stuff like this, Kevin, and even much more to create those opportunities for people to connect. Because I think a lot of times people don't know how, you know, so much of it is virtual. We've been for two years very isolated from one another. And so as community leaders, how do we create the opportunities for more connection? Tell your stories. Tell your stories. Tell them wide and far and don't leave anyone out in the mix. I mean, for years, folks were hiding. And, you know, it's important to have people representing you, having seats at the table at various levels of government, but telling your stories to your neighbors and making sure people know you, they have a much harder time dragging you down if they know you personally. I was listening to a podcast this morning and, you know, the, there was a, I forget the candidate's name, the gentleman's name, but he, he took over after David Duke on the, uh, you know, white nationalists sort of uh, group. And, you know, folks from other religions and other uh, backgrounds befriended this man and and talked to him on a very personal level. And by the time he was done, because his rallies used to be just taking people down and uh, with his white nationalism. And by the end, he could no longer uh, ignore the fact that he now was friends with all this various diverse cross section of people and changed his whole theology, his whole thinking and theology and no longer 
um, really spread the lies and hate of white nationalism. And so, I mean, that's how it's worked here. You know, I, I had to be a poster child for uh, marriage equality here with my partner at the time. And, you know, it's easy to stand up when you're already out and, and, and folks can say, okay, I recognize and, you know, and feel fine with it. But in reality, there were so many people that have just been hiding and unable to really feel comfortable telling their stories. And it still happens today. I'm surprised because sexuality is so much more fluid and people are so much more um, able to sort of float around. But I, I will say that if you continue to just tell all your neighbors, your friends, your family, that they can't support somebody, a candidate, for instance, that doesn't support your rights. I mean, it's, in, it's essential that you tell your stories far and wide. Thank you. Well, I think that uh, Patty really nailed it. Many years ago was the uh, come out. And um, we still have National Coming Out Day. But for us, every day should be National Coming Out Day. Um, the truth is, is that we have more political power and support now than we've ever had before. And we need to remind people, we're their neighbors, we're their relatives, we're their friends. And um, this whole thing of people having a, uh, I always say you have a mouthful of scripture and a heart full of hate. It's not okay. And I, I, Marcy probably knows this really well. In Massachusetts, one of the first states to um, pass gay marriage. And what happened after that? Well, then they tried to pass a state constitutional uh, legislation that forbid gay marriage. So what did they do? They got creative. They went and they found every couple that had gotten married and they contacted them and they asked them, will you send a personal postcard or make a personal call to your legislative representative and tell them who you are, how you live in this community and what you do. So they made it personal and it worked. So I, th I think that using creative personal tactics is really important. Um, focusing on emotional arguments um, and positive values, love and commitment. It's hard for people to be against that. Um, cerebral messages are harder for people to embrace discrimination, the Constitution, it, it, it's not nearly as easy to embrace as love and commitment. So I think that we have to be creative. Um, there's a, a fairly new book by a guy named Mark Solomon. Um, it's called Winning Marriage. Um, it's fascinating political tactics of how that entire, the entire campaign to pass gay marriage worked and some of the um, very, very creative tactics that were used. So the opposition is always about family and faith. And we have got to frame our issues on personal, our personal lives and who we are because we're a pretty great group. I like being around you guys. So um, I, I think it's really important that we're not always on just the defensive. We have a lot of political power right now. People support us. We do get hammered by politicians and legislative items. But the truth is, the majority of people in this country support us. So circling back around, um, you got to get everybody you know to vote because they really do support us. I could ditto everybody, which I will. Um, 
I, I think the thing is we really have to look at the fear and trauma that permeates all of us. Um, internalized homophobia, um, a lot about trans, uh, our trans brothers and sisters are often shocked by the murder. It's part of misogyny, I truly believe. Uh, the hatred of women weaves its way through that reality as well. The other thing I think I'd like to share is a personal story, and it's about being visible and having your story out there. It can change minds. We used to have a button called, it says, the personal is political. You know, I'm sure I still have that button. Uh, my partner died 10 years ago in a hospice. She had ovarian cancer. And it was in Maine. The hospice was in Maine, and it, the Maine had yet to pass the marriage bill. And there were a few nurses at the hospice who were very open about being against gay marriage. And when they saw the commitment that Robin and I had for, she was there about two and a half weeks before she died. And um, the nurses were sharing stories about how people often leave during this time. Husbands walk out, wives walk out, or families can't take it. And they were just moved by our commitment to each other, even in those moments of death, that three of those nurses after Robin passed came up to me hours after saying, we are voting for gay marriage. You are more loving than our relationships with our husbands. And so it was a lived story, whether it's in life or death, I think being out there and being a person who's involved in the community, who works and is in the political office and school boards or whatever, if we live our truth, we're humans first, then we are who we are. So I think we have to think about, we don't wear a mask. We don't say, oh, here, I'm putting on my trans mask. I'm putting on my lesbian mask. We are who we are. And what I always tell the Christians who often come up to me and did in Boston, the greatest scripture quote is, I am who am. And that's the reality we all live by the work we do, by the commitment we have, by the people we serve in our community, and by the political offices we run for and are in. That's how we make the change, by being the I am who am, by being our true selves in this community. Just wanted to make sure everybody in this group um, starts to use the term marriage equality rather than gay marriage, because the accusation forever is that we're looking for special rights. And I just wanted to be clear that, you know, we just want the right to do everything else that everybody else does. I think that's also a, something to talk about when abortion is discussed as well, because it's not pro or against abortion. It is pro-choice. It's pro-rights. And that's where I think there's also some other issues. So given all of this information that we've just heard, um, hopefully we can start to piece together a way to support one another um, in where we're going. And, um, I saw the terms written when all of this started, when I got very involved in being in, involved in human rights. And that started when I was 58 years old. Um, and because up to that point, right? what's that? Just yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I'm 62 now, but, um, and that was a choice that I made because um, someone taught me a long time ago at a Christmas holiday dinner, they asked some, the whole table, well, what do you think of this in politics? And um, so people started to talk. And as I started to talk, it was my turn. It was a very close family friend who was a college professor. And there was 14 of us at the dinner. And he said, before you say anything, did you vote in the last election? And I said, no, I didn't. He said, you have nothing to say. So next person, please. And from that moment on, I think I was 30. I voted in every single election. All right. So enough about that. Let's talk. Since we talked grassroots um, and the importance of that and the importance of people getting to know each other, let's talk about New Mexico. 
Um, let's talk about Santa Fe. Let's talk about Albuquerque. Let's talk about all of New Mexico um, and our communities here. So what can we, can we maybe pull together some steps that we can um, uh, impart on the constituents here on both um, our allies and the LGBTQI plus, and we need to mention two-spirit community. Um, what can we do to organize? What can we do to mobilize? It's organize and mobilize and, and maintain at this point visibility, but I'm gonna say political visibility. So I'm gonna throw it back to you, Adrian. Well, I'm sorry that our friend Marshall Martinez from Equality New Mexico isn't here because I would say that New Mexico is in some ways uniquely positioned as a state that has two very strong statewide organizations that do this kind of work, and that's the Transgender Resource Center and Equality New Mexico. And so in a lot of other states, there is no group like that that's going to give you all the information that you need just by signing on to the mailing list. If you get on the TGRC website and the EQNM website and sign up for our mailing list, we are always going to let you know when there's policy stuff going on, when there's legislative stuff going on, when it's time to email your counselor or your, your rep. So here you have the incredible convenience of having us curating it for you. And all you have to do is get on our mailing list to know what's going on, even if you're in a very rural part of the state, even if you're not able to connect to other people in real life, you can still connect to these organizations and be part of the movement in our state. So I would urge folks to sign on to the TGRC mailing list and the EQNM mailing list to be connected at the most fundamental level. I'm going to give you just a teeny bit of history because I guess that's my role here today. But uh, I can recall back to 1991 because it was the Senate Bill 19. It was Senate Bill 91. And um, there was a small handful of us that seemed to have some time on our hands. Um, some of us artists and other groups. And we had vigils. We had candlelight we surrounded the Capitol around the rotunda outside, and then we marched inside and sang Amazing Grace in the rotunda. It was just one of those times that people just started to flock together. It didn't get us our bill. We were traded for a gas tax under the King and Governor King administration. Um, but what I wanted to bring up because of that is we made allies, straight allies, allies across the board in that process. And I can't tell you how important that is to get your straight allies out there in the fight with you. I can also tell you another sidebar of history. Um, we Well, we didn't get, you know, and we were looking for basic rights, like the right to have a house, the right to have a job. Um, but what we did get just because we made some allies and we weren't in a strong position, you know, 1991, that's 31 years ago. We weren't in as strong as a position as we are now politically, but like three of us met with the speaker of the house at the time and managed to get through, I don't even know how now, uh, technically, the right for uh, gays uh, to adopt children which was not something that was allowed at the time as well. And that just got slid through because we made some strong, very connected allies who understood and stood up. So I'm going to just suggest that you continue to try to um, reach out to those in your family or in your extended circle and build strength in numbers and try and, and have everybody together fight this fight because it's not going away. It's not going away in my lifetime. And I know some folks in the younger generations will say, well, you know, you fought the fight and now we have the rights and we can lay back. And that's not the case at all. Well, uh, there's so much to do. Um, certainly, this isn't a young crowd. <laughs> um, young at heart. We may be young at heart, but we're missing something here. We're missing youngsters. We're missing people in their 20s, in their 30s, 
And um, we have to find a way to bring them in to this circle and be a part of and find a way to bring them in. I know that most of us were doing this work when we were in our 20s. It's been a long time that we've been doing it. And we're missing the mark somehow to get them involved. And we need them. Um, I won't be around to see the end of this, that's for sure. Um, but, you know, we chip away at little things. I made a little list of things that um, at the city right now that we're working on. We're working on getting some legislation together for different things. And other things are just policy, passing inclusive non-discrimination policy, uh, youth anti-bullying policy for city facilities, identifying a police LGBTQ plus liaison, identifying an executive at the city of LGBTQ liaison. And we're in the process of putting together um, a direct line of how we report hate crimes to the FBI. Um, I've been doing this job since 2014. And this is the first year that I have had um, hate messages left on my city phone. Never had that happen before. They've been horrible. They've been clearly directed at me because I'm a lesbian. And they have been sent uh, to the FBI. People are very clever how they do this. There's no tracking it, but um, there's there's folks out there pretty f filled with hate. They're pretty awful. It's it's easy to have a big mouth when you're anonymous. Um, but you know we some of these smaller things passing a inclusive non discrimination policy at the city um, doesn't seem big, but it's important. Got to do it. Better get that done. Um, so those are just some of the little ways that we chip away and and maintain our relevance and make ourselves visible in this community. And every one of them is important. So thank you, Sig. Sure. You're doing. I think one of the things we, and I agree with you about the young people. I At Pride this year, there were a lot of young people. There were. And I was glad to see that, especially if you've been in the trenches for over 50 years. You know, it's like, thank God, or God, is there's somebody else. I, I think the thing that we have to realize is, and this happens in a lot of movements, that when you get some of your rights, complacency can happen. It's like what you said, Patty, you know, well, you did our rights and so now we can sit back. And and I remember when we passed the marriage equality bill in Boston, uh, the first thing I said, do not think that this may not change in five seconds. Mm -hmm. And I think the reality is that laws are not there forever. And as we said, voting is really important. We have a governor right now who is our friend and our champion and uh, who is well known nationally as well. And I think, Kevin, what you did with having the group come, you know, many groups come together before Pride, I think that's a really important thing to do. Um, our community needs educating. I think we have internalized some of that horizontal violence because what media has done to us as well. So I think we have to look at ourselves first and say, what have we, I always use the word transformation. What are the trances consciously or unconsciously have been embedded in our spirits as well, but also in the spirit of others? And so I just came back from San Diego with the National Dignity Conference, and I did a whole thing about the trances the Catholic Church imparted on many of us. And how do we break that? Or what are the other trances we have bought as women, men, you know, and, and whatever our sexual preferences in life? So uh, 
to me, we have to educate each other. The, the, um, the Envision Fund now is statewide. We work with a lot of different groups, and I think it's important that that may be a group we get together as well. Um, so I think we have to look at how do we weave our community statewide together and then look at what is really our political agenda because we have to, to move forward all the time. So, so uh, just to kind of follow up on these conversations here, um, going back to Adrian mentioned, just I want to reiterate the name Equality New Mexico, EQNM. They were invited to be here today, but they are all on vacation. So um, it was wrong time, right people. Mm -hmm. um, the Transgender Resource Center, Adrian is here. These are, and he's very correct, these are very important parts that we have here in our smallly populated but large landmass state that really helps support the community. Um, we, the Human Rights Alliance started um, what we will plan on having as a yearly event and something we need to keep in, in contact with on a regular basis. We called it Envisioning Our Future. Uh, Adrian spoke at that. And it was really about um, learning about the different organizations in the state and what they do. Um, and what I'm going to offer to you all and to anyone uh, who's listening is... Um, we, the Human Rights Alliance, will help coordinate. If you need some help in part of the state and you don't know um, how to fight back and to stand up, contact us. All you have to simply do is send an email, info at hrasantafe.org, and I will look into it. And if I can't help you, one of our board members will, or I will talk with some of my colleagues because... Um, it is important that a many people don't feel that they've been left out in all of this and that, you know, um, they're going up against someone and they don't know what to say or how to say it or what to do. And maybe even if we need to, um, one of us will drive there and come and help because the more people that we can help in this and each of us can do this, the stronger we're going to end up being as a community. We have a lot of brilliant people who've talked a lot of beautiful, creative, thoughtful ways of how, folks, let's start first with what their experience has been and how we all can help change our future. So, on that note, what I'd like to do now is we're running a little ahead of time is to ask if any of you guys have any final thoughts that you would like to say. And I'll start with Adrian and then we can take questions. I think the only thing that I would add is that I heard a lot of talk about um, what's called personalization, which is key, right? The, the telling your own story, the getting to know people that you work with, people in your neighborhood. If you're part of the LGBT communities, to get to know people and put yourself out there in whatever way you can that's safe for you is huge. But what we've learned from other civil rights movements is that there's actually two things that change people's attitudes, and they're not law and policy. They're personalization and then education. At TGRC, we do a really renowned transgender cultural fluency training. So if that's a, a part of our world that you still feel apprehensive about or that you don't know very much about, or even if you do think you know about it, sign up for our training and I promise you, you will feel more confident and more capable interacting with trans and non-binary people afterwards. Get educated, help to personalize us and our stories to other people. That is how we're gonna shift the attitudes and hearts of the people around us. Thank you. That's very important to note. Um, all I would really add at this juncture is that, you know, in the past, we've had various organizations that have helped um, promote education. I don't know if that's part of your mission or the top part of your mission now, Kevin. You know, I mean, because pride becomes the party in the street where everybody's celebrating. But after the party, um, we in the past sometimes have been able to bring people together 
to go lobby uh, at our legislature. Uh, or same thing if there's any legislation up at the local level, try to get groups of folks out and involved. But again, it comes back to just participation, personalization and education, as Adrian mentioned, are, are very key. Uh, I can't stress it enough that you share in particular, like at work or at your home or the family gathering. And I know it, it takes some courage still for folks to come out. I think it's getting easier. Certainly I've seen over the so many decades I've been involved, but it seems like as we regress at the national level, we have to now get back back into the trenches and make sure that we're out there again, doing the work. And, you know, I mean, pride parties are, are, are a blast and, and it's a beautiful rainbow of, of folks that come out there and, and are sharing. I mean, I have so many great memories, um, but these are serious times again, and it's gonna require some serious effort. So come and join. So one person can make a difference. Um, thank you, Kevin. You've breathed real life into the HRA. Real life made a big difference. One person. It's interesting, um, you know, it's a uh, crowd draws a crowd, doesn't it? <laughs> um, and I think we need to remember that a crowd does draw a crowd. And whatever your microphone or your megaphone is, I would really encourage you to use it. Talking about elections and what you need from your family and your friends and your community as far as voting goes. I mean, that's the bottom line. The bottom line is voting. The real true bottom line is we have got to vote and we've got to get everyone that we know to vote. Um, you know, whatever your community is, whatever your group is, whoever your people are, they have got to vote. Um, we may have to get a little creative about it, but we can, we're, we're a creative group. Um, just make sure that in the heat of election time that your people vote. It's it's what we need and it's what we have to do. Um, telling our stories, whatever it takes to get people out to vote, that's what we gotta do. And getting people registered to vote, doing some of the footwork, knocking on doors, everything that has to do with campaigns, giving as generously as you can to organizations that promote our policies, our legislation and just our organizations to help. So again, thank you very much, Kevin, uh, for helping all of us. Thank you. We've all heard the, not poem, but statement. First they came for the communists and I didn't say anything. And then they came for the union people and I didn't say anything. Then they came for the Jews and I didn't say anything. And then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. I think the big thing we all have to realize is we are all a thread in the web of safety for each other. And I agree with what was said, unless we speak out and vote out and vote in, we won't have what we all need. We have to have a voice. Maggie Kuhn, who was the director of the Grey Panthers, which was a, an elder group that started to have elder rights be seen. Her big line was speak your mind, even if your voice shakes. And I think many of us on this panel have been in places where we have shaked mm -hmm. and been shaken. But we learned through that experience that if we don't speak out, not just for ourselves, but for each other, 
the web of safety for all of us at this point in time will crumble. And so it's really important, as I agree with everything everyone said here, that we do, we get out and vote, we get out and educate ourselves, we get out and stand as allies to one another, not as enemies. And so I want to thank Kevin for pulling us all together and for the wisdom on the panel that was shared, but also for all of you for coming out to be out with us uh, and to remind yourselves that what you hold in as being here today is someone who is wanting to be educated. Some of you I know are and all of you are in many ways, but to get out there and speak your mind, even if your voice shakes. Because if we shake things up, our rights will be there. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you all. I do not want to be remiss because there are, are some major national concerns amongst not only the general population, but the LGBTQIA plus population, and that is mental health. It is a very big issue. It's come across my email inbox multiple times. Um, we just recently were awarded a grant from the Born This Way Foundation, which is Lady Gaga's foundation. And they have a certificate that anyone can apply for and take as an introductory learning course online. And it's called the Be There Certificate. And it teaches you how to watch and learn among your peers to see if someone might be suffering from some mental health issues. We just recently did a survey of um, Santa Fe and Santa Fe County to determine the needs for an LGBTQIA plus center. And one of the top things that came back on the survey was support groups. So we can't push that aside, that is all part of our community and we need to be supportive because everyone at some time needs some type of help. Um, and we're, I'm gonna repeat, get out and vote, talk to people, engage people, reach out. Um, I hope to do another session. I don't know if it's going to be through, um, oh, maybe it is gonna be through yeah. this group. Um, but the next session, I know EQNM will be there and they are leading the way, I think, and some of the work that they're doing um, They're One of their um, board chairs, if I'm not, is it the board chair, Adrian, is um, a young person under 25 mm -hmm. who's very dynamic. Mm -hmm. So this, this is key and important. So if there are questions, we'll take questions now. Yes, ma'am. There's a microphone. There. Oh, thank you. First, I want to thank my friend Tashima for inviting me here. Um, I am a straight cisgender elderly woman who's been involved in issues around reproductive justice and equity for more years than I would like to admit. Um, I, I'm I'm really honored to be here. Um, uh, I think what you've said is very powerful, but I'd like to stress in the environment that we're in, how much what happens locally in our state impacts our lives. We, as part of the New Mexico Choice Coalition, working with Marshall Martinez um, and Equality New Mexico, two years ago, we managed to uh, repeal a pre-row statute that criminalized abortion. Um, and it was because allies worked together. It was, it was because of partnerships and coalitions. And I just wanted to stress that Marshall taught me, we worked on an op-ed piece that never got published um, during that session. Um, but I asked him what the genesis of was of his commitment to reproductive justice and access to abortion. And he knew immediately, obviously thought about it. He's a very thoughtful, amazing person. And he said bodily autonomy. 
And that I think is, is at the heart of a lot of the rights that we're talking about and that are in danger. Um, and so I think we have a natural affinity to be allies. And while I agree we need to get out to vote and we need to attract younger people, I think what happens in the next two legislative sessions is really going to be key to, to um, concretizing, making New Mexico a true sanctuary state, yeah. a place where pregnant people can go for the help that they need. And we have an already overburdened healthcare system in New Mexico that is feeling the stress from this in Southern New Mexico. We have new abortion providers coming in without clarity, without relationships, with worry about, about perhaps their lack of understanding of the cultural issues in New Mexico. So what happens in the legislature is really going to be important. We start out, all of us, L LGBTQ people, straight people, uh, women, um, other people who get pregnant and need health care. We start out, we have an equal rights amendment that's part of the New Mexico Constitution. And it was passed and it, it has already shown to be very powerful. But I'd like to suggest that maybe Marcy is the right person because that intersection of our of our concerns it's very powerful and the new mexico choice coalition is in a period of change the formality of the org the group is in flux so i hope that we can form a more clear line of communication between my organization, the Santa Fe National Organization for Women, that Marcy's been, that's how we've met through now, and that as the legislative session comes about, that perhaps we could have a speaker at your chapter meeting and somebody could come and speak at the monthly now meeting, which is still by Zoom. But I just want to thank you for including me for letting me be here and for um just the clarification that we really have strength in allyship and very strong reasons to be allies well thank you it wasn't really a question but um, we have another question or comment yeah thank you so much I never lack for words. Um, I'm curious to know from you, what is the youth scene like in your experience, in the panel's experience, Kevin's experience, right now here in Santa Fe, Santa Fe City County for LGBTQIA+. What does it look like right now for youth? I, I mean, organizations and activism. That's me. Um, there are a number of organizations that support the LGBT, LGBTQIA plus community. Um, certainly um, the Mountain Center is one that has programming right. that goes on. Um, Jen Jefferson was with us from um, the, public the public school system, has an amazing uh, support mechanism and structure. Um, Wendy Layton also uh, was on a panel that we had um, for envisioning our future, and it was part of the new curriculum that was written for social studies for the state. Um, there are other organizations because they're all supportive. Girls Inc. to name one, um, and I'm going to forget some names. Adrian, if you remember any, no, I think you're doing great. And then our, like I said, ours are statewide, and, so like we have. Um, Significant youth programming for trans and non-binary youth, a Discord server that they're on all month long, but also Zoom support groups and things that people can access. Again, here's our literature up here if y'all want to come check these out. And I would also just oh sorry, go ahead. No, no, go, go, go. I would just also say, I know I, you know, not to police your question, right? Just to try to add on to it that over the years in my tenure, I've stopped talking about the trans community or the LGBT community. And I say the trans communities, right? Because if you think about like young Navajo trans women living around Santa Fe, and you think about young white 
trans and non-binary kids go into private school here, I bet they don't feel like a community. You know, they just all happen to be trans. So for me, we think about the fact that this is, you know, LGBT is not a kind of person. We're every kind of person. So it's hard. We're really disparate. We're really diverse, you know? And so that means it's kind of hard to think of us as a community. And when we do, I think we're actually thinking of it as kind of monolithic in the wrong way. And we're forgetting people who are on the fringes of our communities, you know? So I know that there's all different kinds of young LGBT people in Santa Fe and in Santa Fe County and probably having all different degrees of success accessing support, you know? But I think it is, there is a strong, I mean, the, the school system here is very strong and they have some very um, targeted support groups for trans youth and for also for parents that don't supplant ours because our group goes up to 25 and theirs cuts off at 18. So it's a really specific thing. And so we're, I mean, there's, there's no place else in the state that I know of that has that coming out of the public school district. So pretty amazing here. Yeah. And there are a lot of nonprofits um, throughout the city. I work with a lot of the executive directors who uh, mental health groups as well, even domestic yeah. violence groups that really work with uh, oh, youth too. as yeah. well. Youth, youth services and family shelters. Yeah. Mm, there, yes, there, yes, is, there is there is yes, a group. Really they are there. Um, and just to reiterate what Adrian said regarding the public school system here, it is quite unusual program. I actually inadvertently spoke with someone when we were talking about uh, expansion of the Human Rights Alliance and they were trying to help us. And and this woman said to me, oh, m one of my kids is, you know, decided to be non-binary and I didn't understand what it was. And she's in public school and now they are in public school. Um, and the woman said to me, I wouldn't have known what to do in the Santa Fe public school system really helped me. I was it was a beautiful thing to hear. So anything that can expect. Right. The fact that we have so many issues that we've talked about today, but the fact that there is so many support structures that are present here is very important. But we can't um we can't rely on that. We have to kind of mm -hmm. pull ourselves together mm -hmm. um, and understand and recognize that. And the way Adrian's talking about things is we have to think we're all together in this. I mean, indigenous folks, mm -hmm. our black brothers and sisters, the people of color, the LGBTQIA plus two community, however you want to look at us. And I would have to say that across the country, organizations like the Human Rights Alliance, the Transgender Resource Center, EQNM, we have all made a commitment if we're part of Centerlink that we're also on the side of women's rights as well. So it's a, if you put all of those people together, that's a hell of a big group, isn't it? I mean, think about that. Um, so I think to end this, um, oh, 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 another question. So encouraging. Thank you so much. Thank you so much about the schools. I'm sorry, it's my own question. I have a statement first. I want to thank you so much, all of you, for coming to share your stories and for the perspective of how we have to come together. We have to. All stripes and polka dots together um, through coalition, through allyship, through any way we can. Holding hands and singing. Great. Whatever. Um, and my question is not necessarily related, but of course it's all related. Um, what is the energy around this issue or community in the Southern part of the state, in the second congressional district? They, they need help. You might know that. But I, I don't know who knows the answer to that, but. And I was gonna just ask, adding all the rural communities in the oh. state, which is huge. It's it's different. Adrian would probably know more and Marcy, but it's it's quite different um, than it is here. I mean, yeah, you might you want to share some. Yeah, go go yeah, I would just say we work with people all over the state and it's I mean, it's tough, you know, it's hard. They're like the 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 first anti-trans bill that we saw introduced in New Mexico was in 21 and it was the um, anti-trans student athlete bill, you know, centrally generated shadow language, you know, it's, it's strategy, it's centralized strategy, right? But the, the ones they, the reps, they got to introduce it here were the one from Farmington and the one from way down South, you know? 
And once they got into the committee hearing, they realized they didn't even know what they were doing. As we were talking about it, they were like, kind of like, oh, maybe that's not a good idea. I don't know, you know, that you could see them kind of processing it, you know, but it was, you know, that was the only opening they could find to even try to get a bill like that introduced, right? That was going to be killed in committee. So we worry about that. We worry about the the outcomes of elections in those places, and we worry about the individual people. But we also know that folks are trying to connect, that they are out there. That there's always trans and queer people every single place that you go, and that they like we have people from Mora and Deming now connecting into our support groups because they're on Zoom. So that's the that's the idea, right? How do we get people to connect in any way, even if it's virtual? so that they're not so isolated out there, so that we know what's going on with them, so that we can help build power with them. For us, it, in the trans communities, it seems to always start with peer-led support groups. Even starting 20 years ago, that's just where the political organizing started was with these support groups just trying to help each other. So at TGRC, we still see that that's what draws people in, and then they're on our mailing list, and then we can communicate with them and we can have more relationship. But people first just need some support. They need some connection. I think Zoom has been a gift yes. uh, in a lot of ways for all of us. Yes. The the Envision Fund, which is part of the Santa Fe Community Foundation, only did Santa Fe until people start approaching us saying there are people who are LGBTQ who are, don't live in Santa Fe. And so about five or six years ago, they began to become statewide. And it has made such a difference. Yes. Uh, to have people in Farmington who send a grant in for $3,000 to start a center for, they've asked for $3,000 to start a storefront center or some other rural community that just wants to meet on a farm because it's the only safe place. So I think when we think about strategy, we always have to think about those. When we used to, I used to go to camp when I was a Girl Scout um, and did the, uh, you know, jars with the different colors, salt or sand, that the issue isn't just the white salt on the top. It's many layers. It's political. It's, you know, it's physical, it's mental, emotional or whatever. So I think the work that we have all done, whether it is local or our, even our local politics affect other states, either in our local politics affect other organizations like now or whatever, we we really see that the web is so important for us to move forward. And so giving money is important. People donate to the Envision Fund and we've almost raised a million dollars to have that much money over years right now. But we give out about 80 to $100,000 a year to groups that work with our community. And we basically have saved lives. And that's what I think is the key to our work is that, and it's what Kevin was talking about, mental health. The most, what do you want to say, completed suicides in the nation are gay kids. Mm -hmm. And the Sky Center here has been amazing working with young people and suicide. Uh, so we have to think about the outcome of our work politically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, what we do and how it affects the community. So I think we have to look at how supporting the history and the history of this community, starting archives, work we do with the trans community, the work we do with older and lesbians and older gay men or or whatever, wherever they are in their their reality. With, there's a program called SAGE. We gave money to them. So we've got to look at, you know, because we are who we are, we don't start evolving or growing or getting old. So we have those issues, uh, all of us. I mean, nobody can stop getting old. But the reality is we have to have... I worked for women's ordination in the Catholic church for many years or how to bang your head against the wall in one easy lesson. But, <laughs> but one of our one of our statements that I still quote many a time is you don't just add women and stir. You don't just add members of your community and stir. You really look at the patriarchal system or the system of the, the, the city or town. So that's where I think we've, as people who have been in this movement for quite, for some of us, a long, long time, uh, that every step you take, 
every breath you make, what's that song? Um, I'll be watching you. The reality is every step we've taken, we've taken four steps back. And every three steps we take, we take three steps. So I think the thing is we have to continue moving forward and not just saying, well, I worked for years, but to turn around and say, let me tell you the story. Let me tell you how to be politically active. Let me tell you how to run for office. Let me teach you public speaking. So I think we have to just not add ourselves and stir. Systematic change is so important. I think we're finished, unless you have something, Irene, which I think you do. Very end. We are at the very end. Do you want to say anything at the end? Of the uh, well, for, for me personally, I want to thank the panel um, for agreeing to being here and for sharing your knowledge and information. Um, I feel that um, my job is to try to facilitate these things happening and make them become a reality. So um, I've done this kind of stuff before. Now I'm just changing my attention somewhere else. And I'd like to thank all of you for participating. I'd like to thank you, Irene, and Rick, Ann, and Goiko for everything you've done. And um, I hope that this is not the end of this conversation, but really the beginning of it. Awesome. Okay. I did. And then I pressed it again. And it doesn't really matter because I can come here. Um, is it working now? Yes, it is. First of all, I would like to echo Kevin's thanks. You have been an amazing panel of people. And never mind, it doesn't matter how old we are. <laughs> That's right. You are still good. And um, this is number two in a two part series. And the first panel was younger. The first panel was younger. One of the most beautiful and amazing members of that panel was an 18 year old two spirit person whose pronouns were she who I will remember for the rest of my life just as a person so we've heard sort of from a variety of people I'm here to kind of plug we our grand period is over in October and Kevin I am utterly serious um, that we would be honored to provide what we provide here now, which is Rakan, Goyo, and Irene. And we'll, we carry the chairs, we move the tables, Goyo does a lot of brain work, Rakan does a lot of brain work. And we would be very honored to get in touch with you again, Kevin. And because you are the wisest about the outreach in this, we would love between now and mid-October to meet again and okay. to do things. And, you know, we could even do sort of a major get out the boat rally. I'd like to, there is one person in the audience, Kelly, in the white mask back there, who is in charge of voter services for the League of Women Voters. Yes. And she's been taking notes. She's really been listening to you and couldn't agree more on getting out the boat. The last thing I'll say is I do want to plug, we have two more events that are um, actually scheduled to happen. On August 28th, we have an interesting event on ordinary folks getting together to make a difference is what I view it as. It has to do with a food distribution that works under the auspices of the Food Depot. It's an interfaith, it's not the interfaith, not the officially interfaith labeled people, but it's an interfaith group of people started with interfaith people. It now includes, I know them because I work for them. It's the most important thing I do every Tuesday. And it will be, it's called a purpose-driven community. And that's the point of it. That's the point of grassroots, diverse people in every possible way you could imagine getting together and talking about it. And also featuring the customers of the food service who are eager to talk as well. That's August 28th. The three of us will be there and it will be kind of like Kevin's and pride. We're going to do some photography because everybody involved in it has decided they're very happy to have Goyo come and video them. So that's August 28th. We have something coming up. We're ending with a laugh and probably early October. 
it is about the monetization of absolutely everything, which is the world in which we live now. It's going to be a live reading by high school students of a play called Gasping. Gasping is about the people who have the ultimate monetization. They monetize oxygen. Yeah. We're laughing, right? But you can go downtown in Santa Fe now and buy oxygen. There are oxygen stores. So it's it's the play is about 25 years old. They didn't have oxygen stores then. But it's really, really funny. Um, it'll be in the prep theater. So we hope that a lot of people will come out for that. It will really be funny. July is a hard month to run an event. We've had a terrible publicity. So you are so magnificent. I wish that the room were standing room only, but we're Zooming. And we also will be archiving this on the Humanities Council site. And Kevin will also be receiving both panels and the Pride videos. So you'll be able to use that and do whatever you want with in the community. And Goyo does top quality work. So you'll have a very nice artifact. And thank you so much again. This has been magnificent. Thank you.